newsletter comes out about every two months. This one's probably going to be late. It's supposed to come out at the beginning of October. Uh, but you can, it's free. You can get on it. Uh, just go to my website and um, there's a little box in the corner and it says sign up for the newsletter and then you'll get a little email to confirm. Uh, it lists a lot of the presentations I'm doing, workshops, the, the updates and so forth, which I'm not doing much this fall. Uh, but um, it also has some photo tips, coverage of some different locations. I covered east coast of Florida a little bit ago and I'll have some more on that. Uh, this presentation will have a lot of stuff that I've done um, basically because I've been stuck around here, uh, which actually has ended up being a good thing. I, I live sort of in Joppa Town, I guess you could say, and I've discovered a whole bunch of new places, not necessarily always for photography, but I didn't realize there was that much wetlands and stuff around, and we have a nice park nearby called Mariner Park. So with that, I'm going to go ahead. Um, I definitely am passionate about wildlife photography, and so I'm going to share some of the stories behind the images. As you can see, I have a setup over at a friend's house, and squirrels come to visit it and sometimes they knock down the bird feeders and this one wasn't paying a whole lot of attention and the fox was coming in after him and the next image is a video of what happens when the fox comes after the squirrels this squirrel is totally out of it he's not paying any attention the fox is going to emerge from here there's another squirrel he'll head over to here but the fox will come dead in for this one pay a lot of attention to when they make corners they're going to zigzag some uh, animals are amazing. That's the whole thing uh, with me. And I think you'll find this kind of intriguing. So here he comes. I thought the squirrel was dead. No, it wasn't. That was about 12 seconds worth of video. Um, so definitely, I'm going to do it one more time for you. I thought he was gone very close together. Okay, um, what I'm going to talk about some is motivation requirements for wildlife photography, lighting and composition, some related to it, um, locating animals and approaching them, safety and ethics, and also uh, throughout there's going to be some comments on equipment, technique, and so forth. I've done a couple of these programs and hopefully I have buried in the program uh, some of the answers to some of the questions that you might have. At least that was my intent. So why am I focused on wildlife? I just said it before. Animals are super amazing. This is, a, this is actually a young male polar bear, but you can see the size of his foot. My focus on wildlife photography mainly relates to the fact that I want to celebrate their beauty, the abilities, the adaptations, the variety, the behavior of wildlife, and to share my vision with others through workshops. Uh, I have a blog, I've the newsletter, and through presentations like this. I find it challenging, engaging. It's also calming. I have a friend of mine that says I'm never so calm as when I'm photographing animals. But it's almost like a puzzle to put together. You've got the animal, but you don't really have control over it. Uh, you've got the conditions, the weather, et cetera, the temperament of the animal. Was it was hassled recently by a hawk? Uh, got the lighting, you've got your equipment, whatever you have available, and you've got to put it all together to come up with something that is something different and successful image. When I'm shooting, I'm fully focused, and I sort of believe that subconsciously I'm collecting information about that particular animal, about animal behavior that helps me almost subconsciously be able to predict what's going to happen next. Lots of times um, I'm ready to go, and you need to be like that. You need to be ready to report act immediately. One of the things I really like is the fact that with the camera you stop action. You see things with the camera, you're able to freeze time so that you can see features of an animal that you never notice. For instance, it's a dowager and usually if you look at it, it just has this, it has a straight bill. It doesn't have any curves like this. It looks like it's rigid and yet that bird is able to manipulate the ends of the bill that has little tactile sensors there so when he probes into sand or mud he can feel around for organisms and pick them up and eat them so with the camera i can freeze things this is a hummingbird this is a local one this is a ruby-throated hummingbird and yet when i see them flitting about i have no idea what they really look like and 
they're such they're just beautiful animals uh, and a lot of this detail I wouldn't have recognized and lots of times you don't see it in the, the field guides etc I like puffins um, they fly kind of awkwardly sort of they're a little fast they don't always land well the wings are great for underwater catching fish and so forth but I never realized that one might use its wing to prop itself up as it's scratched or this bunny, he was shot down at Assateague and he was on the ground and he hops up about, it's about eight inches or so up onto a fence. It was a fence rail or two fence rails. And he sat there for a little bit, then he stood up and started eating the, the grass at the top. It doesn't look any more appetizing than what was at the bottom, but apparently it was to him. But I'm amazed at the fact that he can sit there and keep his balance. And I do like to watch young animals. This guy, doesn't quite know what to do with the fish that he caught. This was at McNeil River in Alaska. A lot of your success depends on many other things other than your equipment. You can have the best equipment in the world, but you may not get very good photographs. Uh, you need certainly curiosity and imagination to how to approach your animals, uh, knowledge of the animal behavior and also of your camera, and a lot of patience and perseverance. Uh, the more you know about your subject, the better off you are. I'm going to be sipping water now and again. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm a little dry tonight. My allergies are acting up. Um, by knowing about your animal, you're going to know when, where you're going to find it, some idea what it's doing, what to expect to happen next. Now, this turkey probably has either seen another male turkey or seen a bunch of females tur female turkeys. It's dragging its wings. That's one of the characteristics. It's fanning its tail, it's in full strut, chest out, trying to be very impressive and big. I'm gonna refer back to this guy later, or at least this pose. But you can learn a lot. We talked a little earlier about places around Baltimore to photograph. Um, you can learn a lot by, of course, with the web. You've got a camera club that helps out, uh, but you've got biologists, researchers, when you go to a location to sit down and talk to some of them and try to find out about what's going on. Maybe it's a wildlife refuge and what's what the big issues are there. Uh, and also hunters. Uh, I've met some friends that are hunters and I've gotten some good information from them. The Fox project that I've had has definitely tested my uh, t determination. Early in the spring, I had the Fox. He would, one of them would come out in the morning and then I'd have maybe two other ones that would come out in the late afternoon. But for whatever reason right now, because after it got really, really hot and really, really humid, for the last month, uh, they've been coming out after dark and I haven't had any luck with them. Um, I also had some raccoons that were regularly coming out. Right now, they're coming out after dark. So it's a little bit frustrating, but then uh, you can stick know. with it. And you'll see some of the images I got after I accepted the fact that, okay, the foxes and raccoons aren't available, but there are other things. Certainly patience and perseverance is really important. I've taken a lot of pictures of preening birds, but it kept, every time I take a picture, I was trying to get something better than the last one or something different. And to me, this is a special image just because it shows how, just how beautiful, oopsie, how beautiful that bird is and how delicately He's printing those feathers. It's a snowy egret. It was taken in the uh, east coast of Florida. While I was waiting for the fox that may or may not have come, I looked across from me and I saw this little fellow in the, on, right at the edge of the tree line. And he hung around for a little bit. And so I got to take some pictures of him. And I had the brilliant idea, OK, I got some apples in the fridge. They're getting old. I'll, I'll put some of them out at the edge of the woods, and maybe it'll attract some deer. I haven't seen another deer since. However, I've discovered that raccoons like apples. So do squirrels. I've seen a squirrel go 30 feet up a tree with one of my apples. Um, so you always have some surprises. The world is constantly changing. If you go any place and you've taken a sunrise picture there, you know that each time you go back, it's different. So, so never pass up an opportunity thinking you're going to catch it later. This photo op was, this was done maybe four years ago, three, four years ago, and I've never, I've, this is a Bosque de Lampache in New Mexico, and I haven't ever been able to repeat this. I've got other images, but not ones that I like 
as well as this one. I have some snow geese going across the moon and so forth, but this is one of my favorite. And that brings me to this point. These guys were in a tree cavity. I happened, I, when I walk, uh, I walk the trail at one of the parks and I look at tree cavities. I'd look for maybe woodpecker or something like that there. And I came across this little cavity and something gray was there and it was a little uh, young squirrel. So I came back for several days in a row and I got to photograph them. And this is one of my favorite pictures from, from that. I call it sheltering in place because it fits the COVID uh, situation. However, a week ago, I walked past that same tree. Either lightning hit it. This is my cavity here where I shot the squirrels. Something happened. I'll never get that picture again. I'll never have that situation again because this tree is, is a goner. Uh, I don't know exactly what happened to it, but take advantage of things when you have them there. Getting the image right in the camera is something you always hear. Uh, there are certain things that you can't fix. If the picture's totally out of focus, the lighting's wrong, if it's uh, the bird's moving too fast or the shutter speed you have, if you have the camera set on JPEG and you really didn't get enough pixels to blow up the image like you want. Um, so you don't want to depend on post-processing post -processing to fix your problems. However, there are photographers that this post-processing part is 99% of what they love. Uh, and when they're looking at a scene, they are planning for how they're going to post-process it. So I'm not negating that. I'm just saying making mistakes that you can't correct that you didn't plan on, uh, you want to try to avoid it. And raw files, I use raw files because you get the most information from those. Tony Sweet is one of the ones that I just admire for his ability to pre-visualize what he's going to get in the end. He's a great photographer, very different than me. Um, be your own critic. Take a good look both in the camera and on the computer at what you got. Uh, in the playback mode, obviously on the camera, you've got histograms, you've got some kind of highlight indicator. You can look and check on how good the focus is. You can look and examine the background to see if there's a problem. Is there a shadow that's causing some issues? Uh, have you caught off parts of a body? I've had some problems with uh, blue jays. They're big and they've got this lovely little crest and so I'm concentrating on getting my focus on the upper part of the body and the head and so forth. And then all of a sudden I notice that the tail of the bird is out of the frame. Uh, so that's just something to watch out for. These little guys uh, lived in my friend's backyard. Um, it's important to know your equipment uh, really well so that when these guys come out, I know which way to turn my uh, barrel of my camera. I have a zoom lens of 200 to 500 that I was using on these guys. I know which way to turn it to magnify. I know where my ISO is, the button. I know which way to turn uh, my control for plus or minus in terms of exposure correction. And it really comes from the fact that I've been shooting, particularly now, I've been shooting a lot more and all of these things are coming to my mind to tell people about. Um, because it's important to know it. You don't want to have to take the camera down and look at it at the top of it. Uh, you can use the info button that helps some, but you want to be ready. I visualize kind of what I want. I saw this fox. He's certainly interested in something. You can tell by his pose, the foot's up. So I'm going to be ready for whatever might happen. I love the pose. Everything is just the way I want it. Um, Basically, when I have a plan, I'm thinking about, okay, how's the lighting at the time of day that I'm going to see this? How's the background? How do I want to approach it so that I've got the lighting on the right part and I've got a background that I really like? I uh, have my lens pre-selected. I know that this fox, these foxes were really nervous. As soon as I moved the camera a little bit or I moved, if they saw that, they were gone. Um, I check my exposure ahead of time if I have time. You can't always do that. And I try to anticipate what's going to happen so that I'm, I'm ready for that decisive moment. Photography is all about light. One thing I do maybe is a little odd, but anyhow, I actively, when I get to a situation, I'm actively taking a quick look at where the sun is, what's the cloud conditions, am I going to have a situation where the light's going to get softer because of some nice light clouds coming across? 
oh, oh, do I have storm clouds coming in and I'm going to only have a few minutes that I could be able to shoot. Uh, so I'm going to be looking at the rise and fall of light too. So let's take a look at color. Um, light early in the morning and late in the afternoon certainly has color. This is when the sun was actually setting. It was a red ball. I happened to spot, it's a ferruginous pygmy owl, and I happened to spot it. I knew kind of where it hung out and I heard it, um, which is an important thing. It had a very unique call. And um, I hurried up, got the tripod out, uh, electronic cable release, uh, took about 10 pictures. The shutter speed was really slow, like maybe a 15th of a second. I took as many pictures as I could, and luckily two out of the 10 uh, turned out fairly decent, like this one. I usually work in the early morning, late afternoon, when the animal's more active. Uh, that's one of the best times of day, anyway, to see, see animals. And you also have soft light and you have warm light. And one of the nice things is about that light in the morning was it brought out the colors uh, in this uh, Tom Turkey, or it's a Rio Grande Turkey. If you remember before, I showed you a picture of one doing its strut, tail, tail fan, dragging wings, and so forth. Well, I saw this guy in the field doing that. And I saw a number of female turkeys around in the area. And I said, okay, something might happen. And then I saw one of the females, she'll dip. And that's sort of a common thing with birds. Uh, ducks will do it, uh, black neck stilts will do it. The female, when she's ready to breed, she'll, she'll squat and come back up and squat. Uh, and some mammals you'll see, the female will become submissive in terms of her posture. So I saw that and I'm going, okay, something's gonna happen. Now I can either wait, or I can go down the road and find something else. I might find something better, I don't know. But my obvious decision was, considering the light in the situation, was to wait. And maybe it took a half hour, maybe it took 45 minutes. But I got this shot. One of the things I was be, had to be careful of is when he leaned forward more, her head was in shadow. When he leaned back, it wasn't. And since his feathers were so pretty and, and getting caught by that beautiful morning light, uh, I decided that I wanted to spend some time whenever I saw one of the tom turkeys in that kind of light to capture some of the beauty of the feathers that they have. So I try to take advantage of all the opportunities in every situation that I encounter. Soft light is quite complimentary. It's, it's a good light. Right now, I had mentioned earlier the, uh, the fires, the fact that we have a haze right now. Uh, when it's a full sun day, that has been excellent for my photography because it softens the light. It helps me with problems with the background being too distracting, bright highlights, dark shadows. Uh, you don't have any uh, dark shadows on the subject that can cover up some of the features of it. Uh, so late in the day, early in the day, you've got soft light, light cloud cover, haze like we've got today or open shade, you get those conditions. And it's particularly important when you're shooting in the woods because if the light is bright and particularly when it's going towards midday, you've got hot spots all over the place. You've got very dark shadows and the subjects really don't stand out. Even with white subjects, soft light is important. As it gets on, I do a lot of shooting down Chincoteague, uh, Virginia National Wildlife Refuge. And as it gets on in the morning, if I have a white subject, I'm going to begin to forget about trying to photograph it. Bottom line is the light early, the soft light, shows some definition of the feathers. There's some shadows, there's some tonal gradients. I can tell something about the swan. Um, but later in the morning, all of a sudden, all these white areas start casting uh, light into the shadow areas, and it just looks flat. Uh, and you may as well not bother taking this picture. I'm not real crazy about heavy overcast days. Um, that's not to say that neat storm clouds with birds flying and so forth, that could be really interesting. But I'm talking about those flat overcast, heavy uh, gray days where the sky is gray, the water is gray, the <clears throat> colors don't have the vibrance that they'd have if you had some sunlight. You don't have enough shutter speed in a lot of cases to freeze action. And the picture kind of looks flat. It's a big difference between that and something like this, where the sky was blue, maybe there were some clouds, you got beautiful reflections in the water. The sun lit up these iridescent feathers. This is an American widgeon. 
I had shutter speed fast enough to be able to freeze the action here. This would be the alternative on a day that was heavy overcast. The direction of light, of course, is important. Light from behind you and falling flat on the subject isn't usually very interesting. It's very two-dimensional. So side lighting is a light that I prefer. We've got some, sh oh shoot. We have some shadows uh, and tonal gradients. And these feathers almost look like they come off the page. Really side lighting really breathes life into the subject, makes it look real. Backlighting can be useful also, as the portrait photographers know. You've got hair light. Uh, here we've got the light tracing the outside of the bear's ears. It's also catching some of the water droplets here, which makes it nice. This little guy, it was, it was getting close to sunset. And where I was shooting, light was breaking through the trees. And it would uh, cast a shaft of gold on the, the floor of the forest here. And I was watching him, and he starts heading for that. And I'm getting ready. Uh, he walked right into that little shaft of light. And you just got this beautiful golden outline on him. It's a little um, groundhog. Light that passes through subjects also can be quite dramatic. So I like this. Uh, as it's sunrise uh, behind the subjects. Silhouettes. Silhouettes are, it's important that you have, of course, a lit background. The subject needs to be recognizable without any uh, information about the surface of it. In other words, by its shadowed background or by its shadow um, formation there. You can see he's got a fish, you can see it's a heron. If he walks forward over to this side of the, the um, it was a channel, he would blend in with the shadow, then you wouldn't have a satisfactory um, silhouette. So I had to be very careful in my positioning and also watching him that he didn't disappear into the shadow on the other side. This is a typical making use of a silhouette. This one's in here to remind me I was facing east, but it was sunset. So that was in the west. Uh, I had looked at possibilities of shooting some of the animals or the situation with the sunset, the sun going down and so forth, but it wasn't that interesting. And I turned around and behind me, I noticed that the clouds were all picking up the light from the sunset and I was able to get this image. And frequently uh, I'll have a sunset or a sunrise and I'll go, yeah, it's not so hot. But if you turn around and look the other way, you might discover something that's really enchanting. These guys were on a little ridge. This was in Argentina. Um, I was a little late getting there, and I didn't have a whole lot of time to grab a couple Im couple images. Um, I'm laying flat on the ground with these guys on the ridge because if I didn't go down that low, the ground would be cutting off part of their silhouette. They would blend in or merge. Sometimes I do do landscapes. Um, this one is important. Um, it definitely shows the habitat in which animals live. This is the Pantanal in Brazil. This is where jaguars are. Um, you've got caiman, uh, capybara, sloths, and so forth. The thing that I just saw in the news is that they're, they've had a bad drought. Um, <clears throat> their water is seasonal, so it's fairly wet uh, towards winter, April, it starts to dry out. A lot of the tours start then. When you get to August, September, it's, it's drying out more. And this year, it's dried out more than it has in the past, and they have major wildfires. And it's a real shame. This is the world's largest inland wetland, in the, and it's a fantastic place with macaws, uh, highest of macaws, just gorgeous birds. You'll see one later. One of the nice things about telephoto lenses, which I happen to use on this guy, was, is the fact that they have a narrow angle of view. In other words, I can stand in one position and have a background that's very distracting behind my subject, and I can shift just a little. Uh, and because of that narrow angle of view, the background's entirely different. In this case, I shot him against a background that was shadowed, and he's in the sun. That'll work if, oops, sorry again. That'll work if what's black on the subject does have some highlights. If that bill had not had those highlights, then he would just look at the billless woodpecker, which would not be so good. So you have to look for those details. This was also shot with the sun going down, breaking through 
uh, the trees with orange light. And I happened to be photographing this chickadee and all of a sudden I noticed the sun was in position behind the chickadee, the sunlight. It really wasn't the sun, it was just a break in the, break in the trees where the sun was coming through. I had two shots that it looked like it was really the sun behind the chickadee. Uh, and the rest of them, the light had moved on and it wasn't, it, it wasn't anything intriguing like this was. I use flash occasionally. It's not my favorite thing, not because it, I mean, with a lot of animals, it doesn't bother them at all. But this was a situation in Costa Rica, it was raining and the flash brought out some of the colors uh, that you wouldn't have seen uh, on the hummingbird. Shadows can be a real pain. Sometimes I, I get all excited. Oh, oh, look, what is this? Something I haven't seen before. Okay, good, good. And I fail to notice that there's some light shadows. There's a stick coming out of its head, et cetera. Not a very good image. Up here, again, I'm all, ex all excited. There's this heron. He's just, he's just plunged his neck into those plunges, bill into the water. He's grabbed the fish. I got a reflection. Oh, goody, goody. Fast shutter speed. Wonderful. But the shadows are not very nice. Um, it takes away from this image compared to the one below where we've got some shadows. We've got tonal gradients giving some shape to the heron. We've got water droplets that are frozen in space because I had a fast shutter speed. You can see he has a fish, a much nicer background, and you don't have the problems that you had in the upper image. Being able to recognize what attracted you to a particular animal or a scene is important. Was it that it was fuzzy. If it was fuzzy, maybe backlighting would be the best light to accentuate the fact that it was something that was fuzzy. Uh, in the case of this flamingo, I didn't want to do a picture of the whole flamingo because what fascinated me about the flamingo was all the curves, the curves and the feathers, the curves in the neck. Uh, there was just curves everywhere in the bill and so forth. So whenever you see a subject, if you can identify in your mind, what, what was it about it that intrigued me? Uh, once you realize that, you can pick your lenses, your uh, position, the lighting, et cetera, so that you can transfer that uh, particular thought to your viewer of your image. Not so good. This is uh, in Bosque de la Pache. It's both snow geese and sandhill cranes. They come there about mid-November and stay until about mid-February. Uh, it's a wintering area. The refuge uh, plants corn and other uh, grains, et cetera, that uh, help feed these large flocks. There's thousands of snow geese, there's thousands of sandhill cranes. But this picture, I, not a whole lot you could do with it. The sandhill's in a nice position, but the background is certainly distracting. Here he's taking off. It's a little different, nice background. Here we got the frog. If the frog was out over the area that's dark, um, you wouldn't be able to see it. So the background was important. Here is something that I didn't like. This is the place where I've been shooting. And in the morning, in the spring, the light will move across. It's a large open area with trees around uh, and brush or bushes in the background. I have a setup with logs. You'll see it later. But as the light moves across, about 9.30 in the morning, it starts to hit the background behind my setup. And so you get this kind of distracting background. So I know when I was shooting there, I had to shoot earlier than that to capture what I wanted. And this was earlier than that. Um, luckily, the background is a little bit there, but it's not much. Uh, the fox is in the sun. I like the fact that his tail's out and so forth, and he spotted me. Watch out for your subjects disappearing into the background when they're flying. Uh, this is a much better effect going over top the trees. I check my background. This is a thing I do with flowers a lot if I'm doing macro photography. I'm setting up, this is in, again, a friend's yard. This is a uh, cannon lily. And I knew that the hummingbirds in the neighborhood, I have a feeder nearby, they would come to these flowers. So I was focused on the flowers and I got everything kind of set up and I, I take some uh, clothes pins and maybe there's some leaves or something in the way and I'll close pin them out of the way. Uh, but then I'll take and focus on the background for a second. And what I'm looking for is anything that I might not have spotted that could cause some problems. Maybe there's a, 
a dark tree or maybe there's a leaf that's got some highlights on it that I didn't see. And then I'll go back and focus on the flower with those things in mind and plan my position accordingly just to avoid any kind of problems. Some people asked how much do I crop? Um, I crop some, uh, sometimes it's, it's worse than this. Sometimes I can't get close enough uh, and the image is smaller. The more megapixels you have in your camera, the better off you are. I left room around this guy because I didn't, I wanted to catch some shots maybe where he was away from the flower and flying. Um, I didn't know which side he was gonna come in from. Sometimes he came in from the top, sometimes he came in from the bottom. The other nice thing about leaving a little room around the subject is the fact that I have a little less magnification and that can give you some more depth of field. The more you magnify, if I had a tight shot on this, the more you magnify, the less depth of field you have. And I am not sure how close this guy is gonna to be towards me or back. Um, so having this little extra play with depth of field, it was helpful. You all know the rules of composition or guidelines, and that's about all they are. They um, <clears throat> avoid centering. Well, this is kind of centered. Uh, you've got the rule of thirds. Sun should always be behind you. Be behind you. You already know that that's kind of flat a lot of the times. Don't cut off portions of the subject. Uh, well, I did here, and it's just fine. Uh, odd numbers over even. Well, there's only two, but that's just fine too. They're kind of on angles to each other. Usually, that's when things are at uh, the extreme ends of the frame, and you almost have two pictures. All movement must be frozen. You're going to see some images that don't go along with that. So this is the classic, ick, it's in the middle. Uh, it's kind of static, it's not a very good picture. I could crop it and maybe rearrange it some, but he's not very sharp. Um, so he's a, he's a throwaway for me. Um, this guy is diving. Uh, what I really like about it, it is centered, okay. That's just fine because we've got some interesting reflections. And not only that, what I found fascinating was this wing the lighting's different than on that one. This looks different than that one, and it kind of keeps you in the frame and going around. Uh, and that's one of the things you want to try to do. No, I don't have all the snake in the picture. I don't care. My main objective of taking the picture of this rattlesnake was to show the patterns and show the curves. And I think I did that. This is the example of, okay, I cut the foot off. There was a raised part of, of the ground here. It was a little, anyway, berm. Uh, and I was shooting for the car. I didn't want to get out of the car because I was going to scare the turkeys. Um, so unfortunately, I wasn't high enough to avoid this berm. And the bottom line is it was out of focus in the foreground, which is distracting. And I wasn't seeing all the turkey's foot. Possibly I could have put an, I have a bean bag in the window. I could have maybe put another bean bag on top and raised things higher. I might have been able to avoid uh, that issue. Otherwise, I guess I could just crop out and just use the front part of the bird. We want things flying into the frame and not out. Uh, so something more like this, walking into the frame and not out again, like the reflection. We'll talk a little bit about that. This was in, uh, in Norway. I was with Joe, um, Joe and Mary McDonald. Uh, it was a 12 passenger boat out of, actually it was a Swedish boat. Um, in Savard, and it was really a neat area, but only once did we get a polar bear close enough and in good light, and this was it. Um, less room in back, more room in front for, you know, also you've got a feeling he's looking at something. Actually, he eventually went over to the boat and put his paws up on the side, which was really kind of cool. Um, and the guy, the, the one of the guides on the boat, he's got like a long pole, that's it. Um, the bear was just curious and he just went on and curiosity can be your friend. Um, eyes, eyes, they say eyes are the windows to the soul. This guy looks like, like giving your money or else. Um, the eyes on an animal or a person need to be sharp. Um, if they're not sharp, what you have is the illusion that the rest of the picture is not sharp. It's out of focus. Um, I like to have a little highlight in the eye if you can get it and direct contact uh, with me, with my face, my eyes uh, is much more of an intimate shot. So this little guy is curious, nice eyes. 
this little guy is like, go away, I want to go eat, you're in my way. Grass and things that go over top the eye, not a good thing. And I had some real problems I'll, in a minute, I'll show you with my rabbits. Um, often, even if it's a still subject, I'll take several shots because you never know, it tilts its head a little, um, it, the eye may become shadowed, uh, it may become out of focus. Uh, if there are several of these guys, one of them may be out of the depth of field. In this case, they close their eyes and often animals will blink, um, particularly when they're preening, they'll have the eye closed. So taking a number of shots helps you hopefully capture the shot that, gee, these guys have got their eyes open. Uh, and I take a series of shots in a row as I'm following them. This guy gave me some problems. I shot him yesterday, day before yesterday. It's a pileated woodpecker. He was up a little, he was farther away than I would have liked him to have been. But one of the problems with him was most of the time he was banging on the tree with his, all I saw was the back of his head. And only periodically would he quickly turn and then turn back to what he was doing. So taking a series of shots in a, in a row was really important to try to catch him when he finally turned that head because she couldn't predict it. I was lucky with this, he turned his head in a longer amount of time because he was stretching this wing. Uh, and that helped uh, me get that shot. Rabbits. Uh, my rabbits gave me a lot of problems. These are the guys that I got in the last two days. They're two different days, but I had a lot of problems with a piece of grass will go over the eye or the autofocus will lock on the grass and the eye will be out of focus. Um, so I had a lot of grass issues. So what I did was when he'd come up like that, I'd take a quick series of shots, doing my best to try to man actually manually focus on the eyes in a lot of cases to avoid the camera locking onto the grasses. This guy was also in Norway. The tops of some of the houses they have um, basically sod. Um, I had to wait a long time for him to move so that his eye was not cut by the grass. And besides that, I had to use manual focus because the focusing would lock on the grass and not on the, the bird's eye. And I'm, I, as I say, I'm persistent. I might have spent a half hour waiting for things to just get right. Uh, for autofocus, um, sometimes I use single point. Um, Sometimes I use groups. Um, it all depends on the situation where the eye is significant in the picture uh, and there's nothing getting in the way like uh, I was having with some of the grasses, then the single point's fine. And I'm following this bird. It's an immature um, white ibis. And I'm following him, keeping the sensor over the eye as he's moving. Um, sometimes I do use multiple like a group, um, Nikon has what they call nine or 25 uh, point dynamic area mode, whatever. Uh, that is usually used when number one, I can't directly focus on the eye or anywhere close to what's in the same uh, distance as the eye is. Uh, and this works well if you don't have a bunch of grasses where this, the, um, these guys will lock on the grass. Works, I find using group lots of cases when I have a bird flying, it works better than just doing single point because it's hard to keep that single point over the eye. I do manually focus at times, so I might have manually focused on this. This is a scarecrow in my friend's backyard. Um, it was kind of interesting because it had a slit in the arm and there was a hole. We started noticing that this wren go down into that hole and down below is a pocket and that's where the nest was. And um, so I knew kind of where it was going to land. So some of the times I would pre-focus there or some of the times I do use back button focus that separates focusing from pushing the shutter and, and releasing the shutter. Um, and the nice thing about back button focus is I can push it in with the sensor over wherever I think the bird's gonna land. And I can take my finger off and the focus stays there. If the bird starts moving around, he lands there and starts moving around, I can put my finger back on the, the back button focus and follow him. 
camera position certainly is you have with your body one of the best tools to get good photos um i move i try to explore different camera angles uh particularly if i have a subject that's going to stay with me i mentioned curiosity and and int uh, intrigued with animals this is a little snake they were inside my tent uh, i had a blind on a pond i was photographing some ducks when i would come in the morning and open up the blind which is this tent you'll see something later that'll be something like it uh, all these little snakes would come out and so i got some pictures of them sitting on logs and i got some pictures of them elsewhere uh one had caught a fish uh, but this time i thought hey i wonder what it would be like to see him head on so i laid flat on the ground as he came towards me uh, and i got the shot Trying to be at eye level with your subjects is often a good idea, not always. Um, you don't get body distortion. The background is some distance away from the subject, uh, so it, it becomes non-competitive with the subject. It's much more intimate and personal, but there are times that you can't do that. This guy, I'm underneath, I'm with a wide-angle lens looking up because if I hadn't done that behind him, were hundreds of other nests. Um, it's an albatross. They have these mud nests. So there were tons of other birds. And I mean, it was nice for a scene type thing, but I wanted to do something with this young guy that was all fluffy. And one of the nice things about the wide angle lens, it helped emphasize the length of this wing. Uh, albatross spent most of their life over water. They, they spend most of their life in the air. They only come to land to breed. And so that kind of emphasized that. This guy looks so comfy. There's no way I was gonna go down there and get a picture of him eye to eye. That doesn't make any sense. What I really liked was the fact that the way he was comfy, just nestled down in those rocks, which I wouldn't find very comfy, I'm quite sure. He was also pink. And that was kind of interesting because I'd see all their walrus and as they came out of the water, they were white. And I got to thinking, why, why is that? One of the things I like about wildlife photography, these little puzzles and things that you don't necessarily see in the literature or whatever, he's pink because he's warm. The bloods come to the surface and the capillaries, and so he's pink. When they come out of the water, they're white because the blood, when they go down into the cold water, the blood goes down to the internal organs. So it goes away from the surface. So when he comes up out of the water, he'll be white until he starts to warm up which is kind of neat, I think. Um, I look for reflections, try to get the whole reflection in the picture. You've got to have a little higher viewpoint lots of times. I love reflections when it's in the fall or other times when there's these beautiful reflections in the water, not just the animal itself, but from surroundings. Lenses, what lenses do I use, et cetera? Yeah, I use telephoto lenses. They help isolate subjects. They give you a narrow angle of view. They help. They also compress distances. Things in the background look larger. Which ones do I use? Well, I've got a 600 millimeter lens. That's my longest. It's an F4. It's a big lens. It's a fast lens. It weighs probably 13 pounds at least. Uh, when you have small birds like this, this is a little pain of bunning in Texas. Uh, I was still not getting I couldn't get closer to him, so I added a 1.4 teleconverter to the back end of my lens between the camera body and the lens, and that gave me some more magnification so I could get him bigger in the frame. Um, I use teleconverters occasionally. I haven't used it on this project that I'm doing right now. I'm just using the lens to straight, um, but um, I don't like doublers. Some people will use what's called a doubler or 2x converter. To me, they're not as sharp. Uh, they also take away more light. If you use a 1.4 teleconverter, it magnifies, it's sort of like one and a half times, sort of, uh, the size that you got um, originally with the, the main lens. Um, and it takes away one stop worth of light. In other words, it cuts the light in half. So if you get a 500th of a second shutter speed, when you put on a 1.4 teleconverter, it drops to a 250. If you put on a doubler, it goes down to 125, so it makes two steps down, which can be a problem. Um, the other lenses, when I have people in the field, lots of times they ask, what, a, what lens do you want me to be carrying for some of the larger animals, like we do South Dakota, which I was planning to do this September, but didn't do. 
Um, three to 400 millimeter for larger animals is good. Uh, also for large herons, for instance, like a great blue would be fine. Uh, I happen to have Nikon's 200 to 500 uh, millimeter lens. It's very versatile. Um, I can hardly believe it, but it's pretty darn sharp. Uh, and you'll see some images I've taken with it. This is one of them. You wouldn't think of a two to 500 millimeter lens being a lens that you might want to use with a dragonfly. But I happened to see him in the pond, and I happened to have that lens on because I was doing some other things, birds. So I moved in towards the dragonfly, and I got to a point with it on autofocus that it wouldn't focus anymore. If I got closer, it wouldn't focus. One of the things I've discovered, particularly with this lens, with some other ones, if you manually focus, you can continue to move in closer uh, and still be able to focus on the subject. Of course, you reach a limit to that, uh, but I was able to get this image uh, using that particular lens. I mentioned that telephoto lens is compressed. These poles are definitely not that close together as they look here. They may be four feet apart. <clears throat> I also like the fact that you have the color of the poles, the same color of the uh, eye. Birds, when they're in breeding, particularly um, herons, etc., will get different coloration, they'll get different feathers, nuptial plumes, et cetera. There's a story behind this one. <clears throat> I was in Mexico and I was photographing from a blind. Off to the left, there was a tree with a nesting uh, woodpecker. It's kind of like our pileated, but it, it's called a lineated woodpecker. Anyhow, <clears throat> I looked behind me and I saw these cows kind of lined up. And they were kind of looking at the blind and so forth, but I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention until they stampeded by the blind. Uh, there was a little two track that went by the blind and they stampeded by it. And then they stopped, turned around and stared at me. And at that point, I'm sitting there going, mm, this isn't too good. They're kind of large. I'll take a picture or two. If they kill me, at least somebody will know what did it. <laughs> and they go and they go running back in the other direction, stampeding by me. And I'm going, this is it. They're going to do this a third time right over top of me. And cows are curious. And these guys, they had tested me. I had shown that I was not a threat. That's one of the things that wildlife photographers try to do. Uh, and then they came by and they started sticking their heads in the blind and shooing them off and so forth. But cows are very, very, very curious. They also ripped up one of my blinds in the field in Texas. Uh, I actually saw them with pieces of the blinds in their mouth. That was good for them. Anyhow, I thought it was javelina. I thought it was raccoons, everything else. I blamed my blinds getting torn up by other things other than the cows were curious. The longest lens is not always your best choice. If you're trying to capture something flying in the sky, um, sometimes you can't even find it. Um, the lens is so far out of focus and you're, you're not lined up. You're trying to sight right over top the lens, but you're not picking it up. One thing that can help is finding something to focus on, like a line of trees that's partway out, uh, closer to where the bird is. Uh, that way the lens elements kind of line up and it's much easier to swing the camera over and focus on the bird. You'll be able to be able to line up with it and the focus point will be able to lock onto it. I found that particularly uh, important when this was shot with a six. I just did this yesterday. Um, I was actually photographing, well, I was photographing the rabbits and then I was photographing at another setup. And I happened to notice that my little hummingbirds were coming to this butterfly bush. Well, one of the biggest problems with a 600 millimeter lens is that narrow angle of view. And you have a heck of a time sometimes finding your subject. But what I try to do is locate, for instance, the bunnies on the ground. I noticed there was a dead leaf and I could sort of figure out where to position the, the lens, I could sort of sight over top. I was using a, a mesh sort of hide thing, so it was a little hard to spot things. But I was looking, in this case, I was looking for what the pattern of the flowers were so that I could find the bird. I also use a 70 to 200 millimeter lens for scenes like this. This is Tanger Island where I spend, I do some workshops there. Uh, interesting thing about the place is that they have these offshore crab shacks. This is very unique. If we have one of those hurricanes like we just saw in the Gulf, I think the island's gone. Uh, but it's a very unique place with uh, the watermen still crabbing and 
oystering uh, from that community. It's about 400 people now. It used to be like 1,500. Wide angle lenses are fun for things where you want to show the environment. This was in Zion or here when I want to show the massive number of birds. So I do use wide angles. Um, for flying birds, we can talk about this. This was taken in Florida. Somebody told me about this inlet that was really good for, uh, they have drift fishing. Anyhow, there were six ospreys uh, flying in this area. And that really helped me get a couple of really nice shots. But you need fast shutter speeds. You need a little depth of field because you're not sure quite as this bird's moving towards you whether uh, you've really got everything in focus. So I want to talk just about this one. Um, I have used some higher, <clears throat> higher ISOs. I picked an f-stop that was a little higher. I was shooting with a 2 to 5, so it's a 5-6 lens. I gave myself a little edge here with going to an f11 to give myself a little more depth of field because, again, I ain't sure just exactly how he's going to approach. And this was the shutter speed. So you can do hummingbirds without flash. Uh, and that really has been my preference. Uh, these are moving around too much. It's not a setup where you can have just a close area and attract the birds to this tiny little studio thing. Usually with flying birds, you like to have a shutter speed of 1,500 to 2,000 of a second. Usually what I do is I start to focus on them at a distance and then keep the focus. I use continuous autofocus and keep the focus on them as they move towards me. The closer the birds are, the more you magnify, the faster they're moving, the more directly they're moving across the frame, the faster your shutter speeds have to be. And at times, I don't really want a fast shutter speed. I want to show some sense of motion. So this was done at a 200th of a second. Uh, the bird's head and neck are sharp, but the wings, the tip of the wings are showing the motion. And I, I kind of like it. I call it my putting on the brakes. He's just landing. This was done at, um, this was done in New Mexico. It wasn't done at Bosque. It was done at Bernardo. Um, it's a state wildlife management area. These are sandhill cranes. It's about sunset. And I took some pictures, was playing around with shutter speeds, and this was at, uh, one twentieth of a second. Some of them I did at a fifteenth and so forth and experimented a little bit with the effects that you might get. This guy was taken in the Patanel. It's a green, uh, it's a green kingfisher and I, it's the only picture I've gotten of a green kingfisher, but it was really getting dark. Um, and I knew, number one, I'm going to have to put the camera on a tripod because I'm going to have slow shutter speeds. I'm going to pray he doesn't move. Um, by putting the camera on a tripod, I can more sharply focus on the subject. I don't have the fatigue from holding the lens, so you're, all, you're ready to shoot. Uh, and you can examine your composition a lot better. So this gives me the end of talking about tripods. I use carbon fiber tripods. They're expensive, but they're also lighter, and I've got to lug all this stuff around, particularly when I'm shipping things at the airport and so forth. You want a tripod that doesn't necessarily have a center post that you raise to get your shoot, get your height. Um, mine, neither one of these have any kind of center post. You want it to be up to eye level um, at this point. You don't want to have to have anything on top of it. So you pick a tripod that comes up to eye level with the tripod itself, not using any kind of center post or anything else. And then you can pick a mount that you want to use on top of the tripod. You want the legs, number one, to lock firmly. I have had some trouble with some of my older tripods. These, these two are uh, Gitsus. And they're very good tripods. However, as they aged, they didn't lock tight. And I'd be sitting there with particularly something like this, which is like 20 pounds worth of equipment on top of the tripod. And all of a sudden, one of the legs would start to slip and go down. Um, and it can cause some real problems like the whole thing falling over if you're not careful. Um, and this was another thing I learned. This is from um, Marianne McDonald. Uh, when we were on the boat, I said something to her about the trouble I had with the tripods. She says, oh, have you tried uh, Really Right Stuff's tripods, the Versa series? And I said, no. They're usually expensive, but they're well made. And um, so I ended up buying one, and definitely it holds position. 
Uh, they're very nice tripods. They're not cheap, but they're nice. On top of the tripod, top of the tripod, either I use a ball and socket head. I've used this for a long time. It's an Arca Swiss Z series. You've got to make sure that when you tighten the ball, this is the only adjustment. Well, you do have another one. You can swing it around, but usually this is my main adjustment. Um, when you tighten the ball, that something this big, it can hold without slipping. And this ball could do that. However, it moves smoothly most of the time. But if you got in environments that were somewhat dusty or when it got cold at Bosque the last two times, I started having problems with the, the head. Uh, it would stick some. So the last time I went, I took my Wimberley. It's a gimmel, what they call gimmel head. You make adjustments this way and back and forth. Anyway, you can actually balance the camera and with this big lens, uh, with it just floats. You can loosen all the settings and it just holds there if you make your adjustments correctly. And it's great for panning. You've got an adjustment uh, to swing it this way. You've got an adjustment here to go up and down. Uh, and you'll see a lot of the pro photographers have some version of this. This is the Wimberley, it's the early one. Um, they're really good machinists, uh, but there's some lighter ones now out there, uh, different versions that people use. Also, Wimberley made one for the top of a um, monopod. I'm not real good with monopods, so I, I cannot say good things about monopods, uh, but other people do really well with them. I just am not steady enough. Okay, we talked about shutter speed a little bit. We got to talk about the other part of exposure, and that's f-stop. Uh, if you want some depth of field, that is area in front and behind the subject. One third uh, of the area that's in focus is in front, two thirds is behind. If you start off with the lens wide open at a low F number, you get a shallow depth of field. When you have two objects like these guys, these two little groundhogs, I needed some more depth of field. So I went from, I, I had the 200 to 5, so it was a 5-6 lens. That's wide open. I said, that's not going to be enough of depth of field for these guys. I'm going to increase my F number to get them both in. The same thing here with these little dudes, mom and the kids. One of the things about depth of field is, is that the more you magnify, the less of it you get. This is an example that shows you, this is a very small shorebird, little guy. Uh, it's a Sanderling, and you can see how little depth of field you have. It's real important then that you get the eye in sharp focus as well as getting the face of the lens parallel to the, the plane of focus of the bird. In other words, you want to be parallel. Um, the same thing with something like this where you don't have a lot of depth of field. You want to have the lens equal distance from all parts of the dragonfly or damselfly. Our other piece of exposure has to do with um, the ISO. And different cameras react differently uh, to higher ISOs. I had one that at 400 ISO, if I went over that, I had a lot of what they call grain or noise. It's like film grain, uh, but it's, it's amplified noise, electronic noise. Uh, and you can see it here. This was taken at a 3200. Uh, ISO. And I had to do that. I didn't have a choice. He's in partial shade. He's back by the woods. Um, so I found out that Topaz makes an interesting uh, plug-in for Photoshop. I ended up, I actually protected this area. I took and selected out the area here and I then inversed it, the focus on the background, and I put it in to this filter that's called Denoise AI, that's made by Topaz. And I have been very pleased uh, with the effect. It doesn't always do perfect things, but you can see that back here it is much smoother than it was there. And he really stands out. In terms of exposure, um, I do use aperture priority a lot, not all the time. It works fine with a picture like this. That's pretty much average overall. We've got sort of an 18% gray uh, log there and, and so forth. But you get in trouble when you end up with a scene like this, where the subjects are against a background that's quite contrasting to what they are. Uh, you've got several choices. You can go to manual metering. Uh, you can go to spot and spot off of something kind of neutral on the subject. 
If you can't do that, you might find something you can substitute that's uh, neutral. Uh, it's kind of 18% gray, uh, but it's in the same light as your subject, and you can use that as a base. And with these guys, I went a little bit darker so that I could protect the whites, because you can't capture everything from black to white, even with digital cameras. Uh, so we can't capture everything we see. Hunting and photography. There are similarities. There are things that hunters know that are worthwhile for you to know. Um, they use blinds, they use decoys with like ducks. Um, they use cover scents, uh, baiting, um, game calls, all of these things we can use as wildlife photographers. Knowing just the animal behavior, if you see lie spots where they lie down at night, you have some idea where you might find them. You may see a trail, I'll talk about that with a little fox. Um, and also the way you approach an animal, uh, some of the stalking things can be useful. Big difference between hunting and photography. You gotta be a lot closer than the hunter does. When the hunter shoots an animal, he might be able to shoot that antelope at 200 yards away. When you start talking in yards with photography, you may as well forget it. You're gonna be much closer. So the main idea with wildlife photography, you got two choices. You can either get the animal to accept you by your behavior, or you're gonna have to hide carefully in a blind or, or with, what they call ghillie suit. Anyway, we'll see something on that too. If you're gonna approach an animal, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, you're gonna move slow. You're gonna keep a low profile. You don't wanna appear as a predator or a threat. You're gonna pause periodically. You're gonna pretend like you're like them. Um, with that pronghorn, years ago, I had a small group uh, in the field with me. It was a workshop. And we spotted some pronghorn at a distance. And so we started making our way out there. And I said, okay, we're going to spread out. And we're going to pretend like we're just, we're going along and eating some of the grass and whatever and take your time. And eventually we regrouped uh, out in the field where we had some fairly close enough distance that we could get some shots of the group and so forth. It was, it was a nice time of day. Light was really pretty. And then all of a sudden the male comes over to us. Curiosity is your friend if that animal doesn't feel like you're a threat. He came over, he looked us over, he said we're too ugly for his group, and he walked off and the girls followed him and they weren't disturbed by us at all. So avoid intense eye contact with your subject, avoid loud noises, perfumes. A lot of people use um, soaps that have a perfume to them. What you don't wanna enter into the field with is something they're not familiar with. Uh, obviously, you don't want to get between a young animal and an adult, uh, or male and female, if they're kind of starting to interact. Uh, if you have something that has a snout, uh, such as an anteater, he has an extremely good sense of smell. He can't see worth anything. Same thing with tapers. I had a taper walk within 15 feet of me, and he never saw me. Um, the bottom line is if you're downwind from them, they don't know you're there if their vision's really bad. Uh, if you're in the water, you're shooting from a kayak. Uh, if you're standing or waiting in the water, you also have a better chance the animals are more curious and they don't perceive you as a threat. This guy was a curious guy. I was lying on the ground with a bean bag and it walked up to me. Uh, it took and looked at me and then slowly moved away. I mentioned out of focus foreground as being a problem. In this case, it's kind of nice because it kind of feels like a frame or builds a frame around the uh, roadrunner. Uh, some birds and other animals, <clears throat> the adults, if they have young, will actually try to attract you to them by walking towards you, which can be very kind of uh, different. Um, you're going, why are you here? Why, why are you approaching me when usually you're running away? Well, usually they're hiding something, either it's a nest uh, or uh, young. When I go to Iceland, one of the things that I try to schedule. I try to schedule it like end of June, early July, because that's the breeding season for a lot of the birds. So like Wimberleys, these oyster catchers are everywhere. Um, because I have a red shanks. I have a better chance of being ever to get close up images of these adult birds because they actually are trying to attract my attention. 
when you're shooting, there's certainly ethics. You want to make sure that you are not, number one, pressuring the animal. You don't have him blocked in. You don't uh, block his escape routes. Uh, you don't want to be chasing after them. They move away. You go ahead. They move away again. You go ahead. You want to go back to doing whatever they were doing, and sometimes they'll come towards you because uh, they don't perceive you as a threat. Main thing about ethics, don't do any harm to the subject or the environment, and don't invade somebody's private property without asking for permission to be on their property. How do you spot animals? Well, if you know the environment, uh, it helps. <clears throat> Depending on where I am, I can spot animals a lot easier after I've been in that environment for a couple days. I look for things that are out of place, shapes that are out of place, colors, tones that are out of place. For instance, this rabbit. <clears throat> when I go to South Dakota the first day, I am not very good at spotting animals. And by the second or third day, I'm great. Uh, but the environment's totally different. So these things that don't fit in, uh, it's different for the different, different places that you go. Uh, identifying habits. This guy and his friends would come to this particular field. And at the end of the day, when I was heading back to my cabin, I'd always check this field because they were often there feeding. And sometimes they gave me opportunities for some great shots. These guys, this quail, um, they were at Bosque del Apache and they hang out near the visitor center. So if you know something about the, the area, et cetera, you know where to look for them. There were some dusting areas uh, that they used. There were some feeders there uh, and I was able to get the shot there. This guy, he was near uh, his hole. There's an interesting story about him. Um, one of the things that I could tell if he was going to come out or one of his friends were was that the bushes above him would shake. This is an uprooted tree, it's big. Uh, there's a hole, there's one hole, but there must be two passages. But anyway, when one of the little groundhogs would come out at the edge, I could see the bushes shake and it wasn't the wind. So I knew where he was. But this raccoon and the groundhogs both used the same entrance. Apparently there were two separate paths once you got inside. And one day I see the little raccoon go in and all of a sudden the little raccoon comes flying out with the groundhog right behind him, short little legs running like crazy. They hit the woods, the raccoon went up the tree and the groundhog moseyed back to his den. So apparently the raccoon went to the wrong area or he was, he may have been aggressive towards some of the young, I don't know. I look at perches, if I'm down Chincoteague, I'm always looking at different little tree snags for either hawks or uh, kingfishers. Lots of times they have a favorite and they keep coming back to it. I listen. Uh, that pileated woodpecker uh, I talked about earlier, I heard it. I heard it thumping. I knew it wasn't a small woodpecker, and so I started looking for it. This one here is a red-bellied. It has a very distinctive call, so as soon as I hear it, I start looking, uh, checking the trees around. Ospreys, lots of times uh, in this area of the country and in Maryland and so forth near the Chesapeake, you've got a lot of ospreys and you can often hear them before you see them and then you can start watching them and see where they go and I got this shot. When you're out in South Dakota and you visit some of the prairie dog towns, you might find the prairie dogs uh, barking periodically. The whole colony may be barking but lots of times you'll have different ones. Uh, you try to identify the ones that are a little bit more active. However, lots of times they're doing it for no good reason that I can see, but other times they're doing it because there's somewhere there's a predator around. So if you see that kind of behavior, for instance, I noticed that the fox was probably around. I didn't always see him. He was hiding in the shadows. He was hiding behind bushes, etc. But I was pretty sure he's around when the squirrels scattered and they start to have a bark uh, that's pretty distinctive, that's kind of a warning bark. The crows start to get active. In fact, uh, I got a picture of a hawk just recently because the crows were, were uh, chasing it. Uh, but the crows would be active calling when the fox was around and the groundhog, he was kind of interesting. I heard this kind of, I thought it was a bird call. 
and I'm standing there, I've got my phone and I've got an app for, for birding and different ones have the sounds of the birds, the calls and so forth. And I'm kind of listening to different things as I'm hearing this call. And all of a sudden I went, you know, it seems like most of that call is coming out of the same area where that den is, where the groundhog was. And then I looked him up on internet and found out they're called whistle pigs. They actually almost sound like birds when they give an alarm call, so it's kind of cool. Uh, I spent some time at a local park and I did a little setup uh, with a feeder uh, and some logs. There was some Forsythia blooming at the time and I ended up getting the picture of this wren, but the park became more active as more people with COVID had been exercising and going out and they were, they'd come with big bags of peanuts and they'd spread peanuts everywhere. And the bottom line was my animals weren't particularly interested in my setup anymore. But there was one little place where the small birds came and it was a little stump. And if the light was just right, it had to be soft. Uh, I would put some twigs or some other branches out there and some of the smaller birds would come to it and I got this shot. This little guy, he was in the neighborhood too. I only had a chance to shoot him twice. Um, he, was, he was moderately shy, but he was actually curious in this case. What I did was I saw where he came out of the woods. There was a, a trail where the, um, the foxes would enter out into this field. Uh, so I okay, said, okay, I'm gonna get a little bit down from that. I put on, it's not this fancy a ghillie suit, but this is what's called a ghillie suit. It was a mesh uh, suit with leafy things, three-dimensional. Uh, I wrapped up my tripod with the, the camo netting and so forth, and I sat near some brush. And lo and behold, he came out of that trail. He spots me. He's kind of curious. He's young. He kind of comes over towards me. I'm having a heck of a time with grass being in the way. And then all of a sudden, Daddy comes, and he starts barking, and Junior went gone. Uh, and I didn't have much luck with him after that. I do use some blinds. You can get blinds from like Dick's has them on sale. You can get something for like 50 bucks. You can build your own. In Texas, I had ones that I built myself just with a wooden frame and, and camo material. When you put a blind out, you need to put it in a place where you know you're gonna have something happening. It doesn't do you any good to put it in the middle of the field if, if there's nothing to attract the animals there. So <clears throat> when I was in Texas, I had ponds that the, uh, the ducks would hang out at, particularly there was an entrance where there was a well and the water was coming in there and there was a lot of food there. So I knew where to put the blind and I pay attention to the background. I pay attention to how the sun's gonna hit it. Maybe this blind's for morning, this blind's for afternoon. Um, in the case of the location that I've been shooting at, I would add different things, but it's nice to have water for the birds if you're gonna put out bird feeders to attract them and sewage feeders. Cover is a good thing that you're, this is permanently there. Um, this is in a friend's house. I can't tell her to move the feeder, uh, but it was near shelter. I, I found an old log and I, we put it in concrete. It's hard to move, but anyhow, and I'd put the suet feeders near it and I'd get um, both uh, woodpeckers and uh, this wren uh, down the bottom here. This guy walked across the, beam here. This guy was hanging on one of the feeders. I like the fact that the foot's way over there. Squirrels can do anything, I think. Uh, I tried not to shoot them on the feeders. As I showed, I tried to shoot them off of it in nice locations. I also used floating blinds. This was some many years ago. It was the year that they had the major floods in Utah and they had the major um, mudslides uh, like at Ogden and so forth. This was out at Bear River. And I went to a salvage yard and I found some basically logs of styrofoam. It was really packing for, for like automatic weapons. And so I bought several of those and I hooked them together in a square and I put the post of the blind in there and it's a stupid looking blind, but it worked. You can spend money and buy blinds. This guy uh, sells them, he's in Czech Republic, so it takes a while to get them. Uh, but this is what I got from my blind. Uh, he was comfortable with me, he would, or she, would, um, they nest on, they create nests out of floating vegetation that's rotting, so it has some heat. So when he left, he'd flop the grasses, the, the rotting vegetation over top of the eggs, and it kept them warm, and he'd go off and feed, and he'd come back, and he'd take the 
covering off and he actually has a brood patch. You can see this little pink patch when he lays down on them and he'd just plop right down on them. So it was a great situation. I often shoot out of the car, so to a lot of other people, you can get all sorts of devices. You can get bean bags that have beans. Uh, some of them have plastic pellets, which I don't particularly like. Um, um, I use rice a lot. Uh, bird seed will also work. Um, and this is one you can buy, and you can sit it on the ground as well as putting it over the uh, sill of the car. This is a stupid one that I made. I'm not a great seamstress. I kind of looked at one and I kind of came up with an idea and it's, I call it the big bubba. It's big, it's heavy, um, but it's great for my large lens. And it has two legs that go over the side. It's elastic here so I can control how much, actually how much um, give I have in the top. Uh, but you can get other things that uh, B&H sells these uh, for, it's a ground pod. Uh, you can get one like this that also you can put on the ground or on the top of a bean bag. Some people, this is another uh, bean bag that's sold. Uh, this person put it over the window, it maybe gave him an extra height, but sometimes the windows are a little shaky, so I don't usually do that. I'll put it over the sill. Why do I do it? Because I can move with my subjects. Uh, this was down in Merritt Island, and these pelicans, and actually there were some avocets that came in, that Louisiana heron and the spoonbills, they were all following fish, schools of fish that were moving back and forth. And the nice thing was I could move with them. If they shifted position, I could move the car. Uh, where do you go to shoot? Well, there's locations outside the U.S. I had mentioned that the Pantanal is a great location if you want jaguar. I've been to uh, Peninsula Valdez in, um, in Argentina for, for penguins and for um, seals, sea lions, etc. So there's places, of course, Africa, there are places you can go out of the country, but there's some places that you can just go to, like local zoos sometimes. The food attracts wild birds. I've seen, when I was in Baltimore Zoo one time at one of the little fountains, I saw a green heron sitting there. Uh, he was a wild bird. So botanical gardens and zoos sometimes attract animals. Um, this was actually taken in Norway when we were looking for polar bears. They tend to sit on ice floes, but so do the seals. So this was a nice opportunity. But if you go to places like uh, Prince William Sound uh, and you're there, you know, when it's fairly cold, you might have seals sitting on ice. If you go to Cape Cod, uh, a lot of the seals, there's a lot of them now and they're hauling out on the beaches. That's why they're having some problems with white sharks. Uh, the walrus, uh, I photographed at Round Island, which is a haul out place in Alaska. So they're famous places where animals come. But one of the best places is a wildlife refuge. Um, this was shot at uh, Bosque de la Apache. There was a flock of actually 60 um, turkeys the one day. Last year, I didn't have that many. I hardly saw any, so it just depends. But the wildlife refuges are managed for wildlife, either a food supply, the habitat they need, etc. And when you go there, in a lot of cases, there's a drive or whatever, and the animals are used to seeing people and not being hurt. I like places where there's kind of like a dike road, and right alongside the road is a waterway, and you can get some really nice close pictures of ducks. There's other places to go. Waste reclamation facility wetlands, a great thing. I discovered that in long time ago in Corpus Christi, where there was a, basically what they are, waste treatment plants, where the final stage of purification to get rid of the nutrients is pumping the waste out into a marsh, either man-made or otherwise. And in some cases, these places have boardwalks. There was one in North Padre Island that had a nice little boardwalk. I got great pictures of a, of a little green uh, teal, um, green winged teal. Uh, they're small, they're hard to get close to, but he just sat there because there was a boardwalk. He was used to seeing people, nobody bothered him. There's plenty of food. Uh, in Florida, there's a number of these. One of them is called Wakatahatchee. Green K is another one. Uh, but there are others, there's Orlando wetlands and so forth, but they're great places. 
lots of times either they have a road, uh, they have dikes, they have impoundments with dike roads that you can either walk or drive, or they have boardwalks. This is uh, the birds nest like within almost arm's distance away from you. Uh, so they're cool places to go photograph. There's also alligator, uh, alligator Farm in St. Augustine, which is famous for the rookery for um, both wedding birds and spoonbills. And there's Gatorland has also one small one. <clears throat> when I'm in Texas, I'm looking for water sources. When it's dry, it's a good place to photograph. Um, campgrounds. Uh, this guy was actually knocking down uh, pine cones from the tree and he would knock down several and then he'd go pick them up and he'd go stash them someplace. But campgrounds, lots of times, uh, picnic areas, there's some leftover food and sometimes these little critters will be around. Uh, I look for activity where there's uh, a food supply. In this case, these juniper berries are, this was at uh, Assateague and the cedar waxwing was coming in for the berries. At the end of the summer down at well, this was actually taken at Chincoteague, but it could have been at Assateague, where the waterways start to dry up and the fish start to concentrate because it's the end of summer and there's not a lot of room where you get a lot of herons come in and feeding on them because it's an easy, easy catch. Down the bottom, you actually have uh, some immature night heron and he's looking at crabs because the water became so warm, there wasn't enough oxygen for the crabs to breathe and they'd actually come out and crawl around on the surface, on the mud and it attracted raccoons and herons, et cetera. Or you can go someplace where there's fish and a salmon run and you might get a bear picture, like Cat Mai. Timing of where you go, fall is great, like the Bombay Hook, Delaware, for migrating snow geese. If you can go to a place like Point Pelee, it's up on the Great Lakes. Small birds, when they fly over large bodies of water, either like the Gulf or uh, the Great Lakes, as soon as they hit land, if they've run into any kind of storm or any kind of strong headwind, et cetera, they are tuckered out and they land in trees and in places you never think. And you can almost walk up to them uh, because they're tired, they need to rest before they move on. Uh, in Delaware Bay, you've got the situation at the end of May uh, when you have a, a full moon that you'll get horseshoe crabs coming in to lay their eggs in soft sand and following them is a great migration of shorebirds. This is a godwit. There's all sorts of shorebirds. Thousands upon thousands of shorebirds leave the coast of South America and move through uh, the bay. They stop here for about two weeks to fatten up on these eggs. They either dig them out of the sand, some of them are floating, and then they'll head on to their nesting grounds in the Arctic. And then there's the wintering areas, also good places to go. Predicting what's gonna happen. Um, there are signs, for instance, bent leg, okay, one's leaving, the other one's probably gonna follow, plus he's gonna push off, you can tell that. Some birds will defecate before they leave. Um, wing stretches. Uh, it's very common with turns that they'll flex their wings some before the group takes off. <clears throat> this guy took off right after he flexed his wing. This guy dove in the water after a crab. So there's signs, chatter. Um, the snow geese are in the field. All of a sudden they start getting loud. They're chattering. Sometimes nothing happens, but sometimes they're starting to look around real nervously. And then it's a good sign that they're going to take off and you want to prepare for the shot. Uh, some birds have a, a particular posture they take before they fly. Sandhill cranes do that. Shorebirds, if you go down the beach, uh, you'll notice that the shorebirds run out with the surf. Uh, they're feeding in the wet sand that's been revealed by the water getting out of the way. And then when the wave comes in, it doesn't want to be inundated by the waves, so it starts running uh, and moves in. So you can lock focus on them. You know what they're going to do. Birds that preen usually flap their wings afterwards, so you just wait. Uh, they're getting rid of the loose feathers. When one bird approaches another or another animal approaches another, something happens. There may be some kind of interaction you want to be prepared for. It. Sometimes nothing. Uh, in this case, these are two hyacinth macaws and one's uh, preening the other. You might have some little action with cute things like prairie dogs or here, these two little chickadees. 
This guy is reacting because he's just been buzzed by another hummingbird. He's an immature male. It's, I never did get the male, the mature male, but you can see the red there. These guys, I do not know what the relationship was. One of them had a nest. This may have been the mate, or they may have been competition for each other. One was in the territory of the other. I do not know. But these are Eurasian um, oyster catchers. And when they get upset, they will lower the head like this. They will screech at a high pitch, and they will run at things, like bigger things. But these guys went around in circles around each other. Uh, it was really crazy. Uh, and I've never seen that behavior before, but it was really cool. So that's one of the reasons why I like doing what I do. Sometimes there's aggressive action when one uh, bird or other animal approaches another. And the very last thing is safety. I'm going to wrap up now. Um, watch out for slippery surfaces, wet moss. Uh, if you're walking along a stream, it's easy to slip, uh, maybe mud. Um, I had some problems with up here. I had to be careful about wet seaweed. Watch where you put your hands or lie down. Um, you don't want to put your hands where there's a snake or something. Uh, incoming tide, something that people don't think about too much, but I nearly got stranded on a little, I was photographing some nesting birds. I was with a group actually, and the guy that was our guide for that area said, uh, uh, guys, I think you better leave now because the tide was coming in and we were starting to get surrounded by water. Um, there is a thing called, there, there is a mud uh, in the Carolinas particularly, but also Cook Inlet that will suck you down. It's just like quicksand. Uh, so you need to be careful and know about things like that. You can get lost in a marsh because the water was one level when you went in and then when you go to go out, your path is gone. Lyme disease is a real issue in this area. I spray my clothes with something that has permethrin in it. You don't put it on you. You put it on your clothes that lasts for a period of time and it kills ticks. Uh, it's what the military use. Sunscreen, of course, and drink plenty of water. Because uh, I have a friend that ended up in the hospital with dehydration. And the last thing is be aware of your surroundings. Tripping hazards are not so good, but stepping into hidden holes, I have a, a knack for that. Uh, I was in Iceland and I went from one little trail to another one and there's like moss covered rocks. And unfortunately, between the moss covered rocks, if you put your foot down in between, you will step in a hole. And I had a backpack on and I fell backwards and I sprained my ankle. And luckily it was at the end of my trip and a, I was able to get home okay. Um, but also watch out. I've seen people do stupid things at edges of cliffs, whether it's like the, the, the Atlantic Ocean or um, the bottom line is Iceland is really bad for this. You have huge cliffs and people lean out over the edges to get pictures of puffins, no good. Um, so people have been killed uh, by doing something like that. And the very last thing is, is remember um, to keep your distance from dangerous animals. Remember that if you're in a national park, the animals are not tame. And this, these guys, uh, I'm sure you've seen some videos where a kid gets thrown by a buffalo. Uh, I've also seen a picture where a woman, um, there are people that crowd these animals stupidly. Uh, and it was an elk and it went after a woman. She wasn't even part of that and basically put its antlers kind of around her and didn't get her. And then he stuck his antlers into a truck that tried to intercede uh, and put a hole in the hood of the car. Um, so be aware of signs of aggression, calling. Uh, if you go to Assateague, remember that if one stallion's going after another, you want to be out of the way. You don't want to stand behind them closely. I've seen people do really stupid things. Um, and they can bite and they can kick and they can kill you. So with that. It's the end. Whoopsie. I want to thank you all. There's my um, website and an email that you can reach me on, and I'm open for questions. Sandy. Hey, I'm here. Um, thank you so much, Irene. So I let everybody know that uh, we were saving the questions until the end. Right. And I think that was good because there was um, so much information um, that I'm feeling that it's great we've recorded this and we'll 
have it up on our YouTube channel for two weeks. So if you didn't catch everything like me, um, <laughs> make sure that you, you know, you have a chance to listen to this um, more leisurely. So anyway, there were two questions that came in. Actually, um, we have Lynn Roberts. Are you still here, Lynn? Lynn? She may be turned off too. Yeah. Oh, if, yeah. I'm just, yes, I'm still here. Oh, good. Hi, Hi Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Um, so you had a couple of questions for Irene. Do you want to ask them? Okay. One was, um, I was wondering how you find the autofocus speed on the Nikkor 200 to 500 millimeter lens. I keep eyeing it. Um, I have wretched upper body strength, so it's, it's a big heavy lens for me, but I it do is. have a, I do have a good tripod. I've got a really right stuff tripod and, and ball head. Um, but um, I do a fair amount of low light action photography. And how do you find the autofocus speed? I have a Nikon D500. Okay. Um, so it's safe for birds in flight with not great light. It's adequate. Um, I, I don't have anything that's any faster. The, the 600 certainly not faster. Um, I use it with a D500. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, a lot like the, even that, um, well, you've seen like even the, 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 a lot of the stuff that I've done around the yard with uh, the foxes and so forth have been with that lens. Uh, a lot of what I did, I did not take the six to uh, Florida either. So a lot of the bird shots I got from Florida were with that lens and I got some flying, you know, turns and so forth. It seems to work better actually with number one single single point focus is a little bit faster and it seems to work a little better with my d500 than it does with the the d850 that may be my imagination but anyhow i hope that helps a little bit it's not that expensive a lens considering um i've been weighing that versus the more expensive um 80 to 400 which is not as long uh, right. It's easier to handhold. I have an 80 to 400 also. Um, the two to five for smaller things um, works well with me, but it I can't handhold it very well. You're right. Mm -hmm. The 80 to 400, you can handhold a lot better. Um, I switch back and forth between them depending on what I'm shooting and, and the situation, whether I have to handhold it or not. It's not very helpful, I guess, but um, I've, <laughs> okay. I've used both. And um, sometimes the 400 just isn't long enough. And you, yep. I'm hesitant to put a teleconverter on a zoom. You can do it. Uh, the brighter, the maximum aperture, the, the lower the F number, the better off you are uh, because the teleconverters need light. They take away light. Yep. So. You can sort of use it with the two to five, but it's not great. Uh, and with the 80 to four, it's not terrific, but I think that's a little bit faster if I remember correctly, it's some of the lower yeah, focal lengths. Yeah, I think it's faster. So keep renting, or rent them both and yeah. decide from that. <laughs> kind of like that. I mean, some people have had good luck with the, um, the Tamron or the, the uh, Sigma, the, what is it, 160 to 600. Mm -hmm. um, I've had people on my workshops that have had them and been pleased. Um, they're fairly sharp, but they're also not light. Not light. No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, one other thing too, when I was, I don't know how, I don't know how true everything is, but anyhow, when I was on the boat with the McDonald's, they're using um, a mirrorless uh, Olymp Olympus um, four thirds camera and the 300 millimeter lens is like really not very big and it's a small sensor camera. So it doubles it. So you're, you can, and image stabilization is in both the body and the lens. And they were hand holding some things that and did fairly well that um, that's something else you might want to consider. I looked at the, the Nikon Z7, the mirrorless, and I still wasn't, I'm not pleased enough with it. Um, it doesn't have image stabilization in the camera if you're using their adapter and your regular lens. Uh, the image stabilization will be there if you use their camera and their lens that was made for mirrorless. 
Um, and it also closed, I had a 70 to, I think, about 24 to 70 or something like that. And it closed focused. It did great. I did um, sunflowers with it when I was, I have a hip replacement. And when I was rehabbing, I used it, uh, rented it. But yeah, renting is a good idea. Thank you. Yes. May, it's, yeah, yep. let's, we, May I get your input? I'm sorry. This is a shutter bug here. My name is Nancy. Hi, Hi. Nancy. Is it too late to ask one last question? No, no. I'm here oh, as long okay. as you want me. <laughs> oh, uh, your presentation was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Um, I recently, um, after saving up for a long time, uh, I purchased a D750. It's my first real entry level, I guess, professional quality camera. Right. And I love the type of photography that you do. And I'm wondering if the lens that came with it, the uh, 24 to 120, is a decent enough one until I can afford something that uh, is either like a macro for like the dragonfly shots or maybe a telephoto for the crane shots at Assateague. What would you recommend is like the next best lens to get? And do you think I can do much with the, um, the lens that I have? The other person mentioned the 8 of 400. That might be something to consider. Um, the lens you have probably isn't good enough for, I mean, if you're going to some place that there's big mammals, like elk or, you know, bighorn sheep and things like that, um, yep. that lens will be fine. But for birds, not so good. You really, you really might want to think about that 80 to 400 um, as, a, as an alternative. It can... You know, you could still do some, you know, tight scenes with it uh, at the 80 millimeter uh, part, but you can also go out to 400 and have a better chance of, of uh, smaller animals. Okay, so you said an 80 to 400? Mm-hmm. Nikon, that, Nikon, Nikon Nikon X1, right. Thank you. Okay. Well, else? Then, Somebody see, else? The, oh, excuse me. The next person... Um, I see put a question in the chat box. So it's Diane Bovenkamp. Do you want to ask? Sure. Hey, Diane, hi. Hello, how are you? Um, fine. Yeah, and I apologize if you had answered this already. I had Don't worry about it. <laughs> half hour or something. Um, I talk fast. <laughs> hey, I'm from Baltimore. What can I say? I'm East Coast kid. But my, mine is more like a philosophical and how do you okay. define a nature paper? And I see, you know, like you're, you're bringing in uh, tools like uh, bird seeders or um, uh, bird feeders, um, other things to try and attract um, the animals out of their, I guess, natural habitat and or um, if you're at a zoo or at a ma managed wetland, is that, I mean, for things like PSA nature competition or to be considered like a quote unquote nature shot. And I know, I know like the non-artistic, is that, is that it or, or, or is it just like the photo just has to not have the presence of humans in it, like guideposts or, or why? Okay. Um, in terms, you know, bird seed, everybody does bird seed. I don't really consider that being compromised. If I was doing some other kind of baiting, then that would be, uh, it could, and I'm not doing live bait, for instance. I'm not putting pigeons out to get peregrine falcons. Um, the wetlands, the managed wetlands, it's a really good thing. I don't consider that a problem. Um, those managed wetlands, it's a good thing. It's, it's a way to clean up the water supply. It's a way to avoid discharging that water into waterways where you're going to get algal blooms and so forth and kill things. Um, so yeah, it attracts, I mean, anything with food or water that attracts animals, I figure is, is fair game. I mean, it's, it's I, anyway, I don't see anything ethically uh, difficult about, uh, about like the managed wetlands and so forth. It would be like saying, going to a wildlife refuge. Well, there's a problem with that because they actually put, they actually manage the water level. For instance, Chincoteague changes the water level at the end of uh, mm -hmm. the winter so that the water level goes down for migrating uh, shorebirds and uh, bosque plants corn and wheat and so forth. So you could say that that's manipulated a little bit too. So I don't consider that an ethical issue. I don't like game farms 
I did a little bit very early on and I won't do it again. I don't shoot in zoos necessarily unless it's wild. Uh, so my shots are not, you know, it's, it's gotta be wild, you know, uncaged wild subjects. Okay. Um, yeah. No, this is just, I'm not a nature photographer. So mm -hmm. this wasn't saying anything about ethics. This was just what is and what classifies it as a nature shot versus an artistic shot with an animal in it. <laughs> I, uh, I like behavior. I like showing behavior and mm -hmm. features of and details. And so it's a little bit of both. It's artistic in terms of your composition, but it's also educational. Um, I, you know, I teach a lot. Uh, I have a degree in biology as well as chemistry. And um, so I always had an interest in animals. And, but it's neat to see what they're doing. And you don't necessarily find that information someplace else, which I think is really kind of cool. Uh, so the thing with the walrus or whatever, I don't think I've ever seen an ar article de dealing with the fact that, you know, it's white and pink and whatever else. And you could probably say who cares. But it's an interesting fact about biology and about adaptations and so forth. So to me, that turns me on. So I'm both scientific and artistic, I guess. Amen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. That's an interesting question, actually. And Judy, um, are you still here, Judy? You had a couple of questions. Do you want to ask Irene? Yep, I'm here. Hi. I'm here. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Yep, um, you're unmuted. Yeah, I'm specifically when I talked about the black backgrounds, I know how to do that just with macro flowers, but when you had the hummingbird in the picture as well, how did you set that up? Or It's shadow. Um, it depended where, where I placed the camera. Um, some of the shots, the flowers were lower and I'd have the green background, but it became a problem because as it got brighter during the day, the other leaves and so forth, you'd have, it would be kind of distracting. What I did was I positioned myself so the background was a little bit darker. It was far away so that it would be out of focus. And I didn't have a bright, lot of bright highlights on it. And it, it's just in positioning uh, that long lens and shifting one way or the other uh, to get a, a shadowed background. It's not, if everything's like that, that's not good either. Um, because it would be, everything would look the same. So I try yeah, not I've to do that. Setups with, that are very elaborate to get hummingbirds in with flowers. And, um, but this, yours was just purely um, au naturel. Yep. Uh, and the one I got with the, the, butter, the butterfly bush, <laughs> I'm so tickled with that one. I was doing the rabbit and all of a sudden, okay, always keep looking. And all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye, I saw the hummingbird. And, uh, and I knew that they were somewhat attracted to the, to the uh, butterfly bush, but I was just thrilled to be able to get that picture. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I did have feeders too. We had two uh, hummingbird feeders in the yard. Um, not necessarily, the one was close to the cannon. So um, it was in the area and the bird would go back and forth there and he'd go back and forth to the fence. And then I put a little stick in the fence and sometimes he'd perch on that little stick. Um, but anyhow, yeah. The other ones, it's just too, I mean, I've looked at doing what they do. Number one, you gotta be in an area, you got a lot of hummingbirds. Well, we had three <laughs> about, that was it that I saw. Uh, a lot of these guys that are doing these things are doing it in Costa Rica. Um, they've, got, they've got a feeder, they've got lots of hummingbirds. Some of them are doing it in a small setting where they've got, you know, a, 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 a flower that they've put, you know, uh, nectar in and uh, they've got two flashes on the bird. They've got two flashes uh, kind of backlighting. They've got a flash on the background and they're using very fast flash. They're doing lots of them are using like manual at one thirty second of a, uh, yeah, one thirty second of a second. Anyhow, uh, power, one thirty second power, sorry. Uh, and it's like, very, very fast, and that's how they freeze the action. But uh, it's, it wasn't even practical to do that here, plus it's a lot of trouble. It's gotta be a, a specialty sort of a viewers to, to wanna do that. But if you go to Costa Rica, you go some places, uh, there's a special hummingbird, um, what is it, in Arizona somewhere, I think, 
McDonald's even do one with hummingbirds and they have all the flashes and everything all set up and you just plug into their setup. So, but yeah, this is a natural. <laughs> I saw pictures that friends who went to Costa Rica um, took and in a way, because it's so controlled, all they did was walk up and press the shutter. It's, oh. it's like um, somebody else did all the work. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, this is a little more challenging. I actually, I did some remotely, which is, it didn't always work well because they, it all depended how, how accurately they came into the flower, but I have what's called a cam ranger. And it's a device that you hook it to the camera, it's got it, Wi-Fi, and it communicates back to my iPad. And I can put it on live view and I can see what's happening. So I can see when the hummingbirds come near the flower and I can fire it from there. I can change my f-stop shutter speed. Uh, ISO, you can do stacking, um, photo stack, like with flowers and things. I was gonna try it with the fox um, with a wide angle lens sitting out in the yard and me being up on the, being a distance, a good distance away to see if I could get him. But uh, they haven't been cooperating coming out when I need them to be out. Uh, but it's an interesting device and you can actually buy an adapter that can fit on the tripod and you can actually, from the iPad, you can actually change, um, you can pan, you can raise it and lower it. Um, it's a little motorized head. Uh, it's probably not the most perfect thing in the world, but um, I haven't played with that that much, but I've tried it out and it works, so, but no. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh -huh. and I I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, well, thank you. Anybody that enjoyed it, send me a little note. I like to see little notes. Um, one of the persons, I think one of the things that was most complimentary to me was one of the guys, I just did Silver Springs, and um, one of the guys came on afterwards and he said, you know what I really want to tell you is you're talking from experience. It's not book learned. It's not you know, listening to somebody else, somebody else gave you the information. You went to some workshops and you learned it all from the workshops. I started out in the late, late 70s, early 80s. Um, I looked at Lenny Rue's work and I looked at his book and there really wasn't anything out there in terms of classes about wildlife photography. And so I started uh, getting into it and then I started doing workshops way back then in the early 80s before, before there's tons of workshops now uh, because stock photography is not going well. It was a way to make a living. But I did workshops, like I say, early early 80s. Uh, I've done a lot, anyhow, over the years. But I enjoy them. They're kind of like taking pictures, too. It's like a puzzle. You put the people together, and you put the scene together, and you put the weather together, and you put the animals together, and you get different things each time. So it's kind of cool. Who else? I see a little picture down the bottom of there. Is that somebody? I don't know. We're getting a lot of great presentation. Thank you. Wonderful, enjoyable. So there's a lot of that going on. Um, so you're getting a lot of compliments in the chat as well. Uh, I don't think we have any questions that are unanswered in the chat. Um, so anybody want to ask a, a question? Just turn off your audio and ask away. If not, okay. it's been a pleasure. Hey, I got yeah. somebody. Okay, yes. Um, um, do you take your pictures, um, uh, are they handheld or are they mainly tripod? Uh, more, more tripod than handheld. Some of these lenses are too big. And I'm also, I have a slight tremor. Oh. So I am not as steady as I would like to be. Uh -huh. um, the image stabilization helps some, but I'm not, I say a 70 to 200 is about as long as I'm going to handhold. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally the two to five I have, if I can brace the camera against something uh, or I'm down on my knee, knee, I can brace it on my legs or something like that. Uh, but um, most of the time, a lot of the times it's one also shooting from the car. I do that a lot, like in different wildlife refuges. I do a lot of shooting from the car. And mm -hmm. so, and that's much easier than running around with a tripod sometimes. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether that helps some too. Some people can handhold. It depends how steady you are. I'm not, and I'm, 
not young anymore. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, someone asked the question that I wanted to ask, uh, your camera that you're using, um, is it D? Um, okay, I use D500, which is a, a slightly small sensor camera, so it gives you a little boost in magnification. And then I use the D850, which has a higher number of megapixels. It's like a 34 megapixel camera, and the other one is a 20 something. Oh, okay. Uh, and also, I have a D5. I haven't been using that as much. Um, I've been pretty pleased with these others, and I'm pleased with their their performance at higher ISOs is, is is better than some of the older cameras. The only thing about the D5 is the the continuous autofocus. the The number of frames per second is higher. I think it's 12 frames per second. And the cameras I have, the other ones are only nine. And I wouldn't mind having that higher mm -hmm. frames per second at times. It was a terrific presentation. I really enjoyed every moment of it. Thank I you. worry that it's long and, you know, it's 180 images. So it's kind of, I'm way different than a lot of the other people that do things and maybe they've got, you know, 50 images and, and but they have a lot of discussion and thought and so forth. So mine's just a little different, but you, I don't want to bore. You've got a lot <laughs> you did not, you did not bore. There was so much information. Yes, it was um, wonderful. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm so glad you, and thank you for letting us record it. We will have it up for two weeks. And I'll send out an email to everybody with the um, with link. Thank and you. I know it's hard to, when, it's, when I talk that fast, it's hard to keep up with everything. So I can understand um, people wanting to look back at it, even with slower presentations. I, I was going to say, Irene, it, even if it was slower, you gave us a lot of information. Yes. And I like that it was a lot on the slide itself. So, um, yeah, to go back and see the recording would be really nice. Yeah. Thank you. I'll have to check it out. I've, I've bumbled a little bit through this one, but um, uh, we didn't I, you I, didn't notice I, it. <laughs> Good. So, anyway, we're, it's 9.51. Um, anybody have a last question? Well, Hopefully thank nobody you. nodded off. <laughs> thank you so much for, for um, presenting to us tonight. It was a pleasure. I'm always looking for more clubs as we talked about. So, and I did take a look at that hub. Um, yeah. So I appreciate the information. And, and I, I appreciate information from your club members also, you know, sharing places that they've been. That was really nice. So I thank you for that. Yeah. It, it has been fun doing these. I didn't think it was going to be. And I thought it was going to be real impersonal and rigid. And I don't get, the only thing I, I miss is the feedback as I'm going along. Do I have you or don't I? You know, are you enjoying the little funny here or the little funny there? Or are you really intent on this part? And I can't see that. And that, that mm -hmm. is difficult for me. Because yeah. I, I usually work the program according to how people are reacting. And if they, they really like my stories, then I do more stories. If they don't, I'm doing more technical or whatever else. And I don't get that kind of feedback. But the fact that I can talk to people either before and after has been a pleasure. And that makes it, it, it really helps. Um, I appreciate that. So, so I don't mind doing these. Those are kind of fun. I'll, I'll try to develop some more programs. But I've been busy shooting <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Shooting and doing the one thing that I hate to do is housework. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I travel, I'm gone for two months. I've got somebody cleaning the, the hotel room. <laughs> I'm eating out. I don't have to prepare anything. I don't have to wash the dishes, you know. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you get stuck with at home, I don't have to do when I travel. And it's like, it's like I get buried in things sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, so thank you very much. And share... Oh. Well, you know, if you, you liked it, share it with other clubs and whatever else. And I thank you so much. Thank and have you. a good evening. Thank you so much. And hopefully we won't have too more smoke. Um, Be safe. You too. Bye. You all take care. Maybe yeah. I'll see you in person sometime soon. Ha. Huh? Yeah. Well, okay. In a year or two. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.